Have you ever heard that expression, not one iota, and wondered where it came from? Well, it's an English expression that usually means not even the tiniest little bit, and it comes from the Greek word or the Greek letter called the iota. Yeah, there's a Greek letter, and it's called the iota. Uh, it's one single letter. And um, this is how that expression may have come to be. There was a religious leader many years ago, back, I believe he was um, in maybe the, the third century AD, but, but I'm not positive about that. But it, it was around that time. He was a Greek, and his name was Arius. And Arius was from Alexandria, Egypt, and he began to teach false doctrine. Um, he began to teach doctrine which denied the Trinity of God. In other words, he said he taught God the Father was God, but then God the Father created Jesus Christ. He, he taught that Jesus Christ was a created being and that the, um, the Trinity was not three distinct persons. So heresy as, as we Christians know it. Well, so what does this have to do with an iota? Well, this is what it has to do. Um, there is a Greek word that, and I'm sure I will mispronounce this. You can look in my blog for how it's spelled. Homoiousios. And there's an I in there. There's an extra I right in the middle of the word. And Arius claimed that the I was not supposed to be there. See, homoiousios means of the same essence. In other words, the same, the same. The Trinity is homoiousius, of the same essence. But he taught that that I, that iota, was not supposed to be in that word. So that it would be homoiousius, which meant of similar essence. So not the same, not the same, but similar. The former is God's truth. The latter is apostasy. So Arius was an apostate. And I think about that when I think about today's scripture passage, which is pretty long, so I'm not going to read it to you. But I would strongly suggest that you grab your own Bible and turn to Hebrews 6 and look at verses 4 through 12 in context of this vlog and the blog post from which it was taken. To sum up those eight verses, essentially what the writer of Hebrews is warning against is those people who have heard the truth, they have heard the gospel, and in so hearing it, they have fallen away. Now, this passage is, um, as I said, um, it, it, it is one that can, can be interpreted either as God's truth or it can be interpreted and is interpreted by some as being something that it was not meant to be. I'm not saying that people who interpret the passage differently from how I'm going to interpret it are necessarily apostates, but um, we just disagree perhaps on that interpretation. But let's back up just a minute. Let, let's talk a little bit more about apostasy while you're finding that passage and, and getting there. There are two types of apostasy. The first is an open rejection of Jesus Christ. And that's, that's what I believe this passage here is describing. This is the person who has heard the gospel and who perhaps has even mimicked the Christian walk for some time. Maybe even convincingly. But the seed of the gospel, God's truth, never took root in their hearts, in their spirits, in their souls. And we see this described in Mark chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Instead, the seed died and the person ultimately rejected Jesus Christ. If you talk to people like this, they can tell you all the right things. They know the truth. They know they can tell you how to receive Christ, how to live the Christian life, but they've not received it into their hearts. And the dire warning of this passage in Hebrews 6 is that chances are, barring a supernatural intervention from the Holy Spirit, they never will. 
This describes so many Americans and it helps explain why we've not had a major revival in this country in so many decades, in so many generations. Americans have had tremendous exposure to the gospel and said, no thanks, we prefer other gods. I think of how many millions around the globe who have never, ever heard, how they long to hear it. And then those here in America who perhaps have been blessed to hear, but whose response has been a slap in the face to God Almighty. The second form of apostasy is the person who hears the gospel and then who insidiously pervasively masquerades as a Christian while convincingly teaching false doctrine, leading people away from the truth. Now, I'm not talking about true Christians who may disagree about various things in Scripture. I'm not talking about that kind of honest disagreement. I'm talking about an apostate being someone who masquerades in a Christian and deliberately teaches falsehood in order to mislead people away from the truth of Scripture. Uh, these people are difficult to identify without spiritual discernment. Arius was an apostate such as this. Now, some people use this passage in Hebrews as proof that those who've been transformed by the holy, incomparable power of the Holy Spirit to eternal salvation can somehow walk away from all that. Note that verse 4 says someone who has tasted, someone who has tasted. That Greek word, and again, I'm sure I'll mispronounce it, that Greek word, giasaminaus, that's terrible, isn't it? That's got to be wrong, draws an important distinction. It only occurs in Scripture in the New Testament in Hebrews 6, 4, and 5. It means tasted. I think about the first and only time this girl ever tasted a cigarette. Don't tell my mama now. My daddy was a big smoker from age nine, and I loved him so. I so wanted to be like him. And so at about age 13, I determined I was going to try and discover what all the fuss was about. So I secreted myself in the pink bathroom after having pilfered one of daddy's smokes and I lit up and inhaled. Gross! Coughing, gagging, sputtering. I doused that foul thing with water. In fact, I flushed the evidence and never went near them again. I had tasted a cigarette and I had rejected it. I did not become, nor do I today have any desire to become, a smoker. I had tasted and given that disgusting item a resounding no. By contrast, when I met Jesus, I tasted and the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to see. And I saw that the Lord is good. And I then drank Jesus in, as it says in verse 7 of this passage. Now that I think back, the Lord gave me that verse when I awoke this morning, me not even consciously aware that I would be studying this passage in Hebrews today. Isn't he wonderful? That verse, taste and see that the Lord is good, that verse is from Psalm 38, 4. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. So not just tasting, not just a little dab, not just sticking the toe in, but then that person takes refuge in Jesus Christ. You see, the believer not only tastes, he or she then sees and then finally takes. That's the difference between a believer and an apostate. The author of Hebrews gives us this warning in verses 4 through 8 because it's often impossible in this life to separate definitively the wheat from the tares, the true grain from the weeds in any community of believers. But God sees and God knows who are his.